Hi everyone, in today's video, we're gonna solve traditional Sudoku puzzles that look like this. Basically what you have is you have a nine by nine grid and you've got a total of 81 different cells within here. In each cell of the puzzle, you have to put a number one through nine. And then each row of the puzzle needs to have a distinct number. Each column needs to have a distinct number and each box needs to have a distinct number. So those are the three main constraints in a traditional puzzle. Today, we're gonna to start with an incomplete puzzle and we're going to solve it algorithmically using Java. Let's go ahead and pull up IntelliJ and take a look. So the first thing we're gonna do with our code is we're gonna have our input data. So let's go ahead and think about how we wanna format it. It's gonna be an integer of some sort and it's probably going to be an array or a list. I'll just go ahead and make it an array to start. And now what we want to do is we want to make a two-dimensional array. And that's because we're modeling a square here. So we have an array of arrays which models a square where each array is a row. And then you essentially have an array of rows that you're adding. So we'll call this board. And then I'll set this to a board that has not been solved yet. All right, can you see how this maps to a Sudoku board? So this is going to be the first row or the zeroth row. This is gonna be the second row, third row, et cetera. So you can see here that this would be the top left box. And all of these zeros, these just indicate that there's currently no value present. I could just as easily do negative one. I could do FF, doesn't really matter. You just need something that is different from one through nine so that the code can differentiate when you don't have a value in place. So I mentioned that there are three different rules you have to follow when you're placing a number. Let's go ahead and write methods to check all three of those things. So for the first one, let's go ahead and check for distinctness within a row. Uh, let's go ahead and say private static boolean. We'll have it return a boolean if it's allowed or not. Allowed in row. So we wanna pass in the board. We want to pass in the row, and then we want to pass in the number. So what we want to do here is we'll say for int i equals zero, i less than, we'll just say nine for a second, i plus plus. We can say if board row i equals number. So let's think about what this is doing here for a second. So what we're doing is we're iterating over each column within the particular row. So effectively we're looking at the whole row right here. If the number is there, then it's not allowed. We have to return false. Otherwise we return true here. Now I don't love that I have to use this nine. I think what I wanna do is I wanna create a few constants. So the first constant I'm gonna make is the box size. And that has a length of three. And there are also three boxes in a grid. So now I can say grid size. And then I can say that that is box size times box size. The idea here is that you'd have a grid size which always has to be a perfect square and then your box size doesn't have to be a perfect square, but it's typically gonna be an integer that's greater than or equal to two. So the typical size is three with a grid size of nine by nine. So in this case, we would say we wanna go over the grid size. And you can see here what we're looking for is we want to go with the current row, every column. If the number already exists in the row, then it's no longer allowed. Otherwise, it is allowed and we can return true in that case. There is, however, a more succinct way that you can code this if you use Java 8 streams. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So what I can do is I can say return int stream dot range. And then just like the for loop, I wanna go zero to grid size. And then I wanna make sure that none match over all the columns. I wanna do board row column equals number. So if this is true, then I know that there are no entries within the current row whose number equals number. All right, so that was the first rule. The second rule is now we want to apply the same logic to columns. So if I copy the code 
and I say allowed in column. Instead of row, I want to put column. And then now I can say for each row, in each column, I can do that. So let's double check this logic. So I'm going to look over the whole grid. And then for each row, I'm going to make sure that within the current column, I'm going to check every row if the number exists. And if none of them are there, then it is allowed in the column as well. All right, now for the last rule, number three, which is a good bit more difficult to code. And that is when you have a box, you want to verify that the box has distinct values as well. So let's say that I wanted to replace the middle value in this top left box. What I would need to do is I would need to check this three by three box right here. So probably the easiest way to do that is to take a look at the coordinates of the entry that I am trying to replace and then find which box it belongs to. So to find the box that it belongs to, what I want to do is I want to find the top left entry within the box. So that would be here, here, or here within the top row here or in the middle row it could be either this one it would be this one or that one and then for the bottom row it would be here it'd be here or it'd be here so to do that what i can do is i can take the row and column number currently here and then i can subtract off of it to get to the top left element within each box so worst case, let's say that I'm in the bottom right cell right here. I would want to subtract two from the row and the column number. If I am in the middle, it would be one and one versus I'm already in the spot, it would be zero. So every time it's going to be less than the length of the box. So what I need to do is I need to take the original row and column position here and then I need to subtract something less than the box length. And what it's going to be is it's going to be the position here minus the position mod the box length. I'll go ahead and write that code here shortly so that you can see it. So let's go ahead and make another method private static boolean allowed in box. This time we want to take the board. We want to take the column number. And we want to take the row number and we want to take the number that we are checking against. A lot of variables to pass in. So basically here what we want to do is we want to have two different starting variables. So the first one is we're going to say box column and that's going to equal the current column minus the column mod box size. So at most with a three by three grid, let's say that our column number here was two, it would be two minus two mod three, which is gonna be two. So two minus two is zero. Or if it's in position five here, then it would be five minus five mod three, which is two. So then that would be five minus two equals three. So that looks like that's what we wanna do. So let's copy this line of code and copy it for row. We can say box row equals row minus row mod box size. And now what we can say is we can do four int i equals zero, i is less than the box size, i plus plus, for j equals zero, j is less than box size, j plus plus. And now here what we can say is we can say if board box row plus i and box column plus j equals number, then we found it, which means that it's not allowed. If we didn't find it, we can return true. So basically what we're doing here is we're finding the dimensions of where the box is, and then we're iterating over the rows and columns of the box. And then here is where we find where on the board we are with the current box. And then we compare it to if it's the number that we're looking for. And then we return either false or true, depending on if we found it. Honestly, there's probably some way that you could convert this code into a stream, probably with flat maps and again with int streams. 
In this case, I don't really see the readability benefit, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as is. All right, now let's go ahead and put a singular method that checks whether all three of these conditions are true. So we can make this a private static Boolean as well. We can just say is allowed. And we'll wanna take the board, column, row, and number, just like last time. And then we'll wanna check all of them. So we can say allowed in row. Uh, be board row number and allowed in column board column number and allowed in box board row column number sweet so now we are checking for whether at a given position we could insert a particular number so now let's get into the meat of the real algorithm here you might want to think, well, I could just put the first number that goes here, and then I would find the next number that goes here, and so on and so forth. But if you've played enough Sudoku, you know that wouldn't work, because let's say that you put a one here because it's allowed. You put a two here, but these aren't ones and twos. Just because they're allowed during the first pass doesn't mean that they're gonna be allowed when you put other numbers in that are actually correct. So what you need to be able to do is you put in the first number that you find that's valid and then you keep going through the puzzle trying to solve it until you find a number that cannot have a number inserted, meaning that you had invalid numbers earlier. What you do then is you need to backtrack. So we're going to add this backtrack type functionality via recursion. Let's go ahead and get into it. So let's make a private static boolean solve method and we'll go ahead and just have this take the board so now what we want to do is we want to iterate over every row and column of the board so we'll do that with two different for loops so for row equals zero row is less than grid size row plus plus and then we'll do the same idea for columns. A lot of for loops in this code. Now we're at a particular cell within the board. If we scroll back up to the board, let's say that we're here. We have a zero, so what we wanna do is we want to try to insert a number here. If we were to have landed on the seven, we would skip it. So what we can do is we can add an if check, so we can say, if board row and column equals our sentinel value of zero now we want to do some extra code here otherwise if we already have a value and we've already solved everything we're going to want to return true here at the end now in the case where we need to fill in a number we're going to have yet another for loop that's going to say int num equals zero num is less than grid size num plus plus now that we're in here, we need to check if the number is allowed. So we can say board, and I don't like how I have column and row switched here. I'm gonna go ahead and fix that. So let's fix that here. Row and column. And then I'll switch these around. Row, column, and number. So now we have an allowed number within our cell. So what we can do is we can say board at the current row and column equals num. So let's say that a value of one is valid in the top left cell and we just put a value of one here. So now here's where we're gonna use recursion and we're gonna try to solve the board again further. And then if we can continue to solve it, then we're gonna return true. If we can't solve it, then we gotta bail. We're gonna say row column, and we're gonna have it equal zero again. And then one last case we have to account for is if we've iterated over all the numbers and no numbers are allowed here. So let's say we've reached here, then we're in trouble. We're gonna have to return false. Okay, so let's double check our logic because recursive functions are notoriously hard to get right. So here we're looping over the board 
And if the current cell we are on doesn't have a value yet, which will be the case for the first cell that we enter when we enter this method the first time, then we need to look at the set of numbers. And actually I do have a logic error. We want to look at numbers. So we want to look through one through nine rather than zero through eight. And now in this case, if we're looking through one through nine, we want to make sure if the numbers one through nine are allowed. So in this case, a value of one is allowed. So we replace the value with one and then we call solve again with the board that we just updated. So now we go back up here, we're iterating through again and note that we're going to skip the first cell because it has a value of one, not of zero. So now we're going to go to the next cell and then we're going to try to find a number for it. Let's say eventually we hit a cell that doesn't have a value. We're looping over the numbers one through nine and none of them are allowed. Then what you'll do is you'll hit false, which means that you'll, instead of returning true here, solve is going to return false and you're going to replace the number that you had put in previously. And then it'll go in and it'll check to see if there is a new one that can be put there. And if there isn't, then that will return false. And what you'll do is you'll just keep backtracking until you find a valid value you can put instead. So I think this looks good because then at the bottom, if all is good, then we return true, meaning that none of the elements in our board had a value of zero. So we're getting close to testing this out. What we can do is we can say if solve board yay else oops so the oops could either mean we have a coding error or it could be that let's say we were given invalid input data and the original sudoku puzzle wasn't actually valid to start with let's run the code and see what we get sad so i've got a bug so i think what's going on is i'm probably swapping row and column somewhere uh oh right here okay so this should be the row and this should be the column because when we call loud in box we call row column okay let's go ahead and try it again and there we go perfect we'll just go ahead and pretend that i intended to introduce that bug to prove that when it doesn't work it correctly shows it not working we'll just pretend so now i want a method that prints out the result when it's successful so we'll just call it print result board. Let's have the IDE help us out a little bit here. And now what we can do is we can say for row over the grid and for column over the grid. Then we'll say column plus plus. Now we can do sys out, except instead of print line, let's just do print. And then let's do board, row, and column. But I want this print logic to be dependent on whether the cell value is zero or not. So we'll say cell value equals the current value at the board. If cell value equals zero, then we're going to want to print empty. Otherwise, we'll print cell value. And I also want to add a space before and after so that the numbers aren't quite so condensed. So the other thing I need to do is at the end of each row, I need to add a new line. And then Sometimes what I want to do is depending on the row position, I want to print out some dashes. So let's go ahead and if row uh, mod box size equals zero, but row also doesn't equal zero. So in this case, what I want to do add a few more extra parentheses. I want to add a little bit of formatting in this case. So I'm just going to add some dashes here 
that will help us delimit the different uh, boxes within the grid. Okay, so this is all right. So now I want to add some sort of bars in between the columns. We'll follow the same sort of logic that we did here. And we'll look at column. Column. And this time we don't want to add a new line character. And we only want to add that little separator right there. And then I wanted to add a few more dashes here. Let's run it and see how it's looking. Sweet. So we solved the Sudoku and now we're formatting it as well. So feel free to try out this code on your own. Try this out on different Sudoku puzzles. Maybe go ahead and introduce a Sudoku puzzle that doesn't have a solution and verify that it correctly doesn't find a solution. Or maybe if someone's stuck on a puzzle, you can solve the puzzle on your computer and then you can give them some hints. Maybe something to think about. And that was a Sudoku solver using a backtracking algorithm that uses recursion within Java. If you enjoyed today's video, please do smash that like button. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day and I hope to see you next time. Take care.